Hello. Good to see you in such large numbers. And it's also very good to see that everybody is very actively sitting in the first row. Um, in some other conferences where I've participated, some people would like to be as far as possible from the speaker. So this means that you are ready to be engaged and ready to play. So let's play. I give you one task. And this comes from my first grade uh, grammar uh, workbook. And uh, there was a task uh, that we had to fulfill, ending essentially different proverbs. Uh, let's do it for one by one. Easy come, easy go. go. Correct, that's very good. So better sparrow in the hand than pigeon on the, on the roof, yes. So somewhere we're flying around. A penny saved is penny. Penny earned, exactly. Two heads are better than, better than one, yes, exactly, something like that. So play is already ongoing, as I can see here. Um, what you can do, cannot do with a mus muscle, you can do with, with your brain or with your head. And uh, I remember that uh, I had this workbook and I filled in all these sort of like spaces in a perfect manner. And I had the last one, which I thought was perfectly correct. By my, but my teacher disagreed. So instead of full highest mark, she had reduced my highest mark and gave me, well, one less. And I was really angry. So when you see the, where is smoke, there is fire. No, well, smoke. Well, as a matter of fact, I thought that the correct one should be, where there is a smoke, there is vodka. So, and my teacher exactly didn't think that this one was correct. So, obviously, there is a space for disagreement here. Well, from one hand, it was really a poor educational experience, because when you think about the poor, uh, well, poor first grader who gets the, uh, the um, mark reduced just because of one well, solution, what he thought was really correct and really precise, then, obviously, it creates quite a disappointment. But on the other hand, well, I can use this example in conference speeches now, which means that it provides a very good example of play. Because essentially what we are witnessing here is play of words. And all kinds of play children love. And play of words is especially one of these types of what is quite enjoyable. So different types of play are out there, but what is exactly what makes play a play? So the core essence of a play is to explore, to learn something new about things out there. And when we are born, then we are essentially hardwired to explore new stuff, to find out new things out there. We open our eyes, we start experimenting, we build different towers, and we see, well, how the towers are falling apart. Our parents might get really annoyed about, well, what this noise again? But as a matter of fact, all the children enjoy this tremendously because it gives them the feeling of exploration. Then usually what we are looking at when we are talking about play is that it's without objective. It doesn't have a particular aim in mind. So we simply do it because it's fun and we enjoy it. So it doesn't have a, well, target. Then it's intrinsically motivated, which means that it's not something that somebody tells us, well, you must play now. We simply play because we love it. We enjoy the act, uh, the, the act of play. Uh, then it's paradoxical because part of it is improvised. So it's completely free. We do it because, well, we, we feel like it. But in order to play be really enjoyable, and especially when we are talking about social plays, so which involves several groups of people doing sim some things simultaneously, then it also is rules-based. So it's free and structured at the same time. But what is quite fun is, in those cases, people are usually um, also reinventing the rules from time to time. So, for example, when two children are playing together and one of them is winning too easily, then they qu quite immediately redesign the rules of the game so to make it sure that it's more even, so that play is equalized and it's enjoyable for the both sides. And the point is that the essence of the play is also to do some basic things the hard way. So if it would be too easy for us, it would become a routine, it would become a little bit too boring. So all the gamification applications out there usually are driven around this very essence that, well, you do the easy stuff first, 
And then you start adding extra new things. And that's why we are hooked to some things such as Angry Birds or 2084 types of games. Because the essence is very simple, but in order to master it, and in order to do it really, really, really well, it requires quite an effort and quite a, a, attempts to, quite a lot of attempts to, to get better at it. OK, let's do a test. What do you see on this picture? It's a human wave. Would you like to try it out? Just remove all your laptops and all these things from your laps. Um, and let's try from this side and see how it goes in this room. So just one by one, get ready, jump up, and we'll do the way which goes to that direction. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one, and go! <laughs> and back. <laughs> and once more. <laughs> How does it feel? <coughs> it feels fun. Did it have any objective? No, it didn't. Of course it didn't. So we simply did it because, well, somebody told us to do something. But the moment we started doing it, what happened? Well, look around. There are smiles. For some reason, well, I started, everybody was like that. <laughs> but now, you are all smiles. So, when we are engaging ourselves in a very simple act of play, it, well, feeds our dopamines, and we start enjoying the process. So, I'll give you a personal example. Some years ago, I was a movie star, and uh, I did a television show where essentially, well, in every episode, teams of three members went to different organizations, and they resolved different kind of management case studies. So the point was re really very simple. It was a tournament where different middle managers from different companies went to other companies to see that whether they can master some of the challenges out there. And we had altogether 32 very nice teams, nearly 100 people from different places, all brilliant, all very nice, or all very engaged in this process. And uh, we saw that, well, what is going to be the result of this? And uh, before the start, we tried to probe on the basis of the CVs which appeared on our production team's desk that, well, probably there are some people who are going to do better at solving these kinds of managerial case studies. And we thought that, well, these are typical manager types. So extroverted, more social, more action-driven, goal-directed, structured thinkers who are there to get the results. If we would have placed any bets during this process and said that, well, we place our bet on that team to win, well, I would have lost my money. Because as a matter of fact, we found out that it was these slightly playful types who were much more successful as a result in this competition. And the point was quite surprising because we didn't really understand where does it come from. And uh, the other side of me, the researcher side of me, decided that, well, it's um, interesting and let's find out. So we started doing a detailed series of video ethnographic analysis. So we looked at some key moments, how these teams were discussing certain things, and we elaborated the core essence of the decision-making points and tried to see that, well, what were the deciding factors in this process? So how were they really better? And some of the results were quite intuitive. So for example, they were able to get better rapport with people. So they were able to really communicate with others much more easily. And obviously, those who were at ease were also more readily sharing information with them. So they had better information gathering abilities. The second was that they were, in a playful mode, also better able to cope with stress. Because all the teams had only two hours for problem solving. And sometimes the problems were quite complex. So how to really manage a complex supply chain in a company? 
So you need to really crush your head and try to understand that, well, what are the facts and how to do the actual analysis. Um, so it was short, and there was also a tension. So at any given moment, there were at least eight members of the crew that were surrounding these people, simply with cameras, microphones, photo cameras, and anybody else, so trying to see that, well, what is, what is happening in there? So they had to withstand all these surrounding uh, factors as well. Plus, later the entire nation was going to look at them. And if they would have failed, yeah, it would have been real embarrassment for them. So the point really was that they could have lost their face. And this probably creates quite some stress, well, if you think about yourself in this particular situation. But the interesting factor was that uh, the most deciding of all these elements was the factor of playfulness itself. Because those people who were the most successful in this competition demonstrated the ability of really trying it out, experimenting, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. So there was a lot of this in the process that we could observe. And that was pretty interesting. So the point really is, um, have we lost some of this ability in the meantime? And there is this classical example of a Stanford former professor, Bob McKim, who has done creativity research at Stanford Design Labs. And this is one of the predecessors of nowadays design thinking. And they have done various, well, different exercises. And one of them involves essentially drawing into some of these bubbles and trying to see that what kind of things can be drawn. Or another experiment, well, you can try it out now. You can take one of your, these uh, papers where you can write, and while I'm speaking, draw quickly a person sitting next to you. Just a simple cartoon. So just take out your paper and pen and do a simple cartoon of a person who is sitting next to you. Are you ready to do that? Okay, let's do it really fast. Okay, 20 seconds. A very quick and rough cartoon. So, 15 seconds remaining. Do it very fast. So, 10 seconds remaining. Do a cartoon of your neighbor. You have to jot it really fast, so the eyes, the ears. Five seconds still remaining. Very good, and the time is up. Now my kind request to you is show your cartoon to your friend next to you. Who So how did it go? I hear there is a lot of laughter. <laughs> some thumbs up. <laughs> but some of you are also somewhat embarrassed that, well, sorry, sorry, I drew you so badly. Um, if you remember, when you were still studying in kindergarten, you drew all the time your mother, your father, anybody else, and nobody paid attention much to how the result of your drawing looked like. And the point really is that, well, as we grow older, then at a certain point of time, we are starting to be judged for the creativity. And there are even people who say that they can pinpoint exactly the moment in their school or kindergarten when somebody said, well, what you drew was really ugly, and that at this very moment you decided not ever to draw again. Uh, despite the fact that you are really able to do the drawings as nicely as possible or as you are finding it suitable. So we really mistakenly judge the ability of being creative by the results. And we think that we are not creative, we are not playful because the result is embarrassing to us. But as a matter of fact, we can also look at it from the other angle and say that, well, let's try it out. When was the last time you drew somebody's face? Years and years ago, I hear, hear the voices. 
So you can try to do it more often. And by practicing, you might be able to do these things also in a lovely way. So let's look ahead. So the point really is that when we are talking about creativity, it's really closely linked to play. And the misconceptions about play are also in our working places. So it means that, well, the traditional saying is that you should not play at work. You should do play while at home, but at work we are serious. But this is also play. It's a play of seriousness. So we go to work and play being serious. Well, there are some companies who have tried to install some elements of playfulness in their working atmosphere. As you can see, some of these sliding tubes, well, which are in some of the offices. However, we can say that only very few people actually engaged on a routine basis in some activities that, that are playful, that are uh, oriented towards some sort of game activity at their work on a regular basis. So, it comes, obviously, from our preconceived uh, understanding on how a functioning workplace should look like, well, and how it was two centuries ago. So it's this kind of Tayloristic working place where efficiency is the guiding factor, the timing is everything, you have to produce everything by the deadlines according to pre-foreseen standards. No experimentation just gives us the result. And, uh, well, in certain occasions, we can also say that this kind of uh, lack of play at the workplace is not created by our bosses, but in certain circumstances, we create this kind of lack of play ourselves. So this is a picture of MIT. And at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the employers of the recent graduates have started complaining already some time that the engineers are not as good as some who were graduating a decade before. And the reason they were saying was that uh, many times the curricula are so heavy and so intensive that people simply do not have the time to experiment and try out things anymore. Well, 20, 30 years ago, there was much more of this kind of tinkering also at the engineering schools, but now when we are so much focused on some of these science subjects and some of the technology subjects, then we tend to forget tinkering and we are too much focused on the outcomes. So, as a matter of fact, some of our creative thinking and productivity also suffers as a result. So let's see, in practice, what does it look like? So there are some companies out there which take a slightly different path. Well, Richard Branson is, in Europe, one of the great examples who really, as a CEO and owner of his companies, enjoys playing a lot. And he also tries to distill the same kind of atmosphere across his companies. In the field of IT, of course, we have other unconventionals who are riding rollerblades when you're looking at the bottom of the photo here to some sort of places who are trying to do the same trying to create more experimentation-focused culture in their companies. Um, there is also plenty of research out there, which essentially says that, well, humor, laughter, is really good for productivity. So not, not, let's not try to be too serious at our work. Let's try to smile, let's try to laugh more often. There is a wonderful person at the United States leading the National Institute of Play called Stuart Brown, who essentially has studied, well, animals at play, who has interviewed former convicts, and the results of their studies demonstrate that many people who later in their life come to be bullies or psychopaths or armed robbers were deprived of play when they were growing up. So we, they were too much focused on, on two serious things. So the opposite of play, therefore, according to their research, is not work. The opposite of play is depression. So the less you play, the more likely you're going to be depressed. So, my own PhD researching this matter. So I thought that, well, let's start, let's start doing research. Well, exciting stuff. Well, these research conferences, are, these are some of the real-life pictures of people listening to some of the conferences. And uh, I decided that, well, let's see the balance between efficiency and innovation in some of the organizations. And the point is that, that really, well, there are companies who need to be efficient, 
but there are also companies who need to be innovative and the best of their qualities, these should be there both at the same time. But there are also companies which decide to do it periodically. And this was exactly my focus of research when I looked at some of the telecommunications firms and tried to analyze that, well, how do they do this kind of sailing against the wind so that they are at certain periods, they are efficiency oriented, and then at certain periods, they are more innovation or playfulness oriented or experimentation oriented. And what I came to conclude was that looking at some of the historic data and actually making also some of the executives play with uh, Lego bricks, for instance, the previous research suggested that it would be a good idea if the companies in these kinds of modes would be doing some sort of short bursts of exploration and short bursts of innovation. The study essentially showed that those companies that have constant routine for play actually perform slightly better than those who don't. So it might be a good idea to like look at these materials and see that, well, what can we learn from that? Let's look at the big picture for the time being. So some data as well. When we're looking at the past, well, two centuries, then the average life expectancy has grown twice the amount. So from eight years of, uh, 40 years of age, we, are, we have now grown to 40, well, sorry, 80 years of age. And uh, at the same time, most of the Western uh, countries where the welfare state has tried to keep up those people who are retired, they are facing essentially complete crisis because when we are looking at this chart, then the ratio of those people who are retired is growing tremendously. So it's a good news and bad news. Everybody who is younger than 40 years of age, hands up please. Younger than 40 years of age, good news to you. You are not going to retire, <laughs> ever. Because the welfare state and pension system like this is no longer working. So you need to find yourself some other resources how to support yourself at your old age. No retirement for you. Good news. So looking at some of the other data, well, matching this information, when we are observing GDP or development of technology or some new information which is out there, then we can see loads of these charts which look like hockey sticks. So steady, 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 steady development and during past 30, 40 or even sometimes 10 years there is this exponential growth. So looking at this kind of thing as well, we, have, we can really say that it's Homo Innovaticus which has born. This is the vision test for those of you who are sitting at the very back of this room. Can you see what is ever written on this page? So think about it. iPad is just five years old in mention. Facebook was not there until just a decade ago. Some things which we now take for granted and we almost cannot live without have only been just recently invented. So all these kind of things that we need to somehow observe, uh, observe and also digest has grown exponentially. So looking at the different revolutions, well, there was a steam revolution, there was an electricity revolution, there was electronics revolution, and now we are talking about the cyber physical systems. So there is a possibility that with GD, uh, with 3D printing, uh, we can create our own internal organs. So when our heart is failing, you can go and ask it to be reprinted and then implanted to you. It looks uh, quite interesting, uh, but on the other hand, also scary. So those of you who are, again, here below 40, those who raise the hands, there is a probability that you will never going to die. So because all your internal organs are going to be replaced within your lifetime, if you are in good health. So you're not going to get retirement, and you're never going to die as well. What a nice prospect. And all this kind of um, technological innovations which are taking place all the time at uh, exponential speed. So this essentially means that you need to learn and unlearn all the time. So that's the picture out there. So the point really is that there are hundreds of jobs out there which are going to disappear in the next decade. 
So how many drivers are there in your country? So all of them will be probably out of work within the next decade or two with self-driving cars, everything else coming up. And they need to relearn. They need to change their behaviors. They need to con completely change the, their, their structures of thinking. And when we're looking at this kind of chart, then all these kind of activities which are more, more mundane and more routine focused are going to disappear. But those activities which require some of these keywords, playing around, experimenting, are probably going to be that. So when we previously said and observed that, well, play at work maybe is not such a good thing, then let's put it from a different angle and say that play at work is must. Because various kind of experimentation techniques are essentially play. We try things out. There is a new gadget. In English language, we are even saying that, well, we are playing around with this gadget and trying to see that what its options are. So play is everywhere. So study, play, innovation, learning, games, imagination, exploration, all these words are going to be really, really, really important during the coming years. And it's quite interesting to see that how are we able to tap onto this intelligence, which is not, low, not uh, any more facts-based, but which is much more focused on something which is creative. Well, some more of my personal stories. I earned quite a lot of living in addition to being a management consultant by simply playing, playing with bricks. And I have a diploma for this as well. And these are a couple of photos from the training when I was attending at it at uh, Billund in Denmark on Lego Series Play Certification. This was the first day. So everybody, when you look at the body language, are slightly careful. Second day, getting interested. And the third day. So everybody standing up, actually doing things, very much engaged and very, very much involved. So what is it about this kind of play that is interesting? This picture comes from the Natural History Museum of London, and it shows two people, and the body parts are proportionate to their cortex areas in the brain, which shows that, well, really big part of our brain is wired to deal with our hands. So this is the reason why we have so strong thumbs to send the text messages, because this is simply so much focused on our brain activity as well. And the core essence of this is that we use bricks in this particular occasion not to have things built, but we use them as the aid for thinking. So do not think to build, but build to think is the core essence of the methodology. The other thing which is associated with this activity of Lego Serious Play is telling stories. So you remember when you were a small child and you were playing in a sandbox, you had, well, these different devices, I have this thing, and I call this now a aircraft. Or I will say that this is a magic wand that I can use. Um, we give meaning to different material objects all the time as children. And we can use the same kind of skill as we're grown up. And we can use this also to tell stories, because this is also imaginative play. We tell stories and we engage people for social purposes, and we also create some sort of new fields of understanding. What do you see on the picture? Yeah. Plane? What else do you see? It's a Lego brick, yes. What else do you see? Sorry? Uh, black square? Yes. Yes. Catapult? The frog? Yes, okay. So all these things are quite interesting. So when you think about these things, and let's start from the backwards. When you said that frog, a frog could be a symbol of what? Of a lake, it can symbolize something indirectly. It can also symbolize nature. It can also symbolize something which is jumping, therefore doing something. When you think about the catapult, what can this be a symbol of? War? Conflict? Quick, quick activities? 
Then uh, a plane. What is this a symbol of? Travel, freedom, speed. So all these words came really easily. And all these kinds of metaphors and associations that come in our mind, they are actually the tools for storytelling. And these are things that we can actually use our, at our work on essentially on a daily basis. So the point of the LEGO series play as one of the structured activities is essentially by going through these paces, somebody presenting a question, somebody builds a model, somebody gives meaning to the different LEGO objects, then telling a story, creating a landscape, then creating connections, testing and generating principles. This is essentially a tool for doing actual work of planning something out in your own work. So it can be a prototype for a new product, it can be a prototype for a service, it can be a story of how do we handle a particular problem in our daily work. It can be something which is associated with uh, creative skills building. It can be a tool for learning, it can be a tool for explaining something to somebody else. So the point really is that when you engage people like this, you make them contribute also 100%, because this shows now that a play also engages people and it motivates them. So the intrinsic motivation starts working. So the usual meeting versus the lean forward meeting, which makes everybody actively participate. So a couple of interesting stories from my experience as a Lego player. In one of the companies, which was an energy firm, there were groups of people who were building very complex energy solutions. So power plants, the power lines, stuff like that. And there was one group who simply took a bunch of plasticine and built a huge resource mine where this stuff was extracted in order to produce electricity and put simply one small Lego brick next to it and said that this is the rest of the company. And all the other people in this room said that, well, do you really see our company like that? And they said that, yes, of course, because, well, 90% of our income comes from this electricity that has been extracted from the mines. And the rest is just small, tiny bits. So before, they were discussing their company as if they had perfect understanding of each other. But now they realize that even though they had worked side by side for 20 years, just playing for 15 minutes, they realized that their understanding of their own business is completely different. And it gave them the full understanding on how the differences can be then overcome and used for different purposes. So another recent challenge related to addressing some of the introverted people. So what do you do when you are working at the IT companies? Because there are different people. Some of them are extremely outgoing, extremely client focused. But there are some people who are really like this, doing extremely good code, but they don't speak a word during a week. And maybe there is a one word per month which comes out of their mouth. And uh, it's quite a difficult challenge because you need to collaborate as a team. And when you have some of these extreme introverts who are not willing to participate, who are not willing to share, how can you engage them? And there was a tool that we trust, uh, also tried to engineer around it. So for example, these engineers who are much more discovery and exploration oriented, we were focusing on the instructions which were much more turn-based. And for them, the game was, aha, it's interesting when I read the line of the code and I, when I move to, to the next line, and then I see and find out what kind of the result, end result is out of the game. The second, the architect's time. So different game again. They are enjoying cr creation, considering different kinds of constraints and limits. And the designers in the game, they look at the possibility of doing visually creative stuff. So all these kinds of play are actively in use in most of the IT companies. Probably you recognize some of the work here as well. And the main challenge for you certainly is that, well, you know how you play yourself, but how do you make sure that also the others with whom you are working on a daily basis, with whom you are playing ideally on a daily basis, can have some sort of rich outcomes as well. So, there are really different types of play. This is a slide with death by PowerPoint. You don't need to read it all. But the point really is that there are different types of play. 
And not all players in your company need to play according to the same schedule and, or the same template. So let's try the different types of player here as well before we wrap up. So let's do a social play. Again, please stand up and face each other in pairs and shake your hands using the left hand. Left hand, please. Not the right, the left hand. And then shake the left hands with the other neighbor and see that, well, how does it do? And once you have done, then get to know each other. So say your name to the others as well. The left hand and the, and the name. Very good. So we just experienced it, a form of social play. So this is one type of play. So let's do another type of play. And this is now a body play. You are not allowed to speak, but you have to face your neighbor and you have to use your body to make the other person laugh. So whatever you do, you must make the other person laugh. And this other person must laugh. But you can only use your body. You can also do it in trios if you, yeah. No speaking, just laughing. <laughs> Very good. So let's do third. Now let's do a word play. And agree which one of you is going to start telling a story to the, your neighbor. And while you tell a story, then the neighbor has a challenge. After two sentences, just say a random word. The first word which comes to your mouth, uh, mind, which has no connection to the previous thing that the other person was saying. And the other person must continue the story using your word. See how it ha well rolls out. I'll give, you, I'll give you a minute to try this game. Thank you all. You can give yourself a round of applause. Can you please sit down? So we just experienced three different kinds of play that you can use in your work in the future or any kind of other social uh, uh, encounters. Just to wrap up. There are plenty of companies out there who are doing different kinds of playful tools in their practice. At my native Estonia, there is one company which is called ReachU. They are doing maps. And this is probably the only one company in the world where the company annual reports are also presented in form of maps. So can you imagine your accountants, instead of regular financial report, drawing a map on how the company is doing? So that's just an example. Um, just two kilometers from where, uh, from where I live, there's the Skype Tallinn office. Their office also looks lovely like home. They have pets running around. They, they do use different kinds of playful techniques as well. There are some office workers who go around and play something different. So they simply go around and sell vegetables and fruits during some, some days just to do something different as well. So the point really is, my recommendation, if you would have to take one takeaway, then I would really love to see that in addition to lifelong learning that we're all talking about so tremendously, that everybody in here would also engage in lifelong playing. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we 
actually have no time because we need to prepare the room. So if you have any questions, you can find Marco at the conference and ask him directly. So see you at coffee and uh, we will prepare for next. Thank you.